You ready? Okay, everybody got, got the notes down? Yep. Now, let's just move forward then, please, gentlemen. Um, so what we're going to do is a very quick refresher of the first video that we did for the polymers. Okay, and we simply introduced you to the idea of what a polymer molecule was. And we said they are large, long-chain polymers, long-chain molecules, and we said they had a repeating unit over and over again, yeah? And then when I talk about polymers, uh, when we're talking about them at the start, we talked about addition polymers, which means it's normally got one monomer, and we add the monomer like end to end to end to end, and we call that an addition polymer. So one monomer, is what we use for an addition polymer. What was the key idea for an addition polymer? What were you looking for in a structure? Repeating. Yes, they're all going to have repeating units, but for a monomer, for an addition polymer, what were you looking for? The A sort of group. You call A. Yeah, but what was characteristic of the A when we said A plus A plus A? What was in the structure that caused it to polymerize? Double bonds. Or it could be triple bonds, okay? So up here, Alright, you recall we were looking for double bonds, okay, to start the polymerization process off. And we also talked about something called a radical, and the radical was the beginning of that. So the radical formed uh, an initiation, if you like, or the, the radical ripped off one of the electrons off the double bond, okay, which then made a large radical and then it started to then carry out that polymerization process. So it's just a very quick revision, alright. Um, from a couple of weeks ago. Alright, condensation we said involves at least two monomers. So we said condensation is at least two, can be more, okay, that come together. And we said the reason why it's called condensation is? Produces water. Produces water. So one of the products of that reaction for every link that we form in the chain is going to be water, okay, every single time. Clint, can you shut the door? Alright, so then we look at the two groups of condensation polymers. There's two large groups. We've looked at this one before, so this one before, when we did the section on proteins. Okay? But, and here's always but, the section that we did on proteins involved an amino acid adding N to N to form a peptide, polypeptide and it was an amide link. But when we're talking about an amide link in the context of a protein, we call it a peptide link. Okay? And I gave the benefit of the doubt for the exam. There was a question about that in the exam. Okay? All right, polyamides. So these are condensation polymers, so they've got two monomers. This is monomer number one, this is monomer number two. And we've got monomer number one again, and we can keep, keep, actually keep on going if we wanted to add these things indefinitely. So the point is, if we go right back to what we talked about in our organic section, we said, how do we make an amide? And we said we make an amide from a carboxylic acid and an amine. The product of that is an amide. There is one little step in between. We said it forms a salt first, and then we've got to heat the salt to form the amide. But, like I said, um, the book doesn't really um, talk about that intermediate step. It just says, a couple of gas plus an amine gives me an amide. That's all it says. Now, if we've got bifunctional, that is, um, structures that have got two functional groups in them, two similar functional groups, they're going to line themselves something like this. So I've done that in terms of the way that I've drawn these, these monomers. So I've aligned the ammonia next to the carboxylic acid because we know that this is going to spit out water, okay? And I'm going to end up with an amide. In this case here, it's not just a single amide, but lots of them. It's going to form a link in the chain. That's what we call it, a poly, many, many amides. So when I form this structure, and I would suggest that what you do, and you will have to draw these things, um, no doubt, in the exam. I prefer to draw all the monomers first, side by side, just a hint. And it seems to work well like that, and so we didn't take that hint in the exam, in the trial. Um, over here, and then I'm just going to make that a longer bond to try and keep the carbons, okay, in this carboxylic acid structure together. 
and I'm just going to keep on going. CH24, make that, okay, C12.0 there, and keep the nitrogen under the nitrogen for that compound, CH2, N, H, and that's going to keep on going. So that's how we form our polyamide. All right. While we're on the idea of polyamide, a lot of you, uh, when you had to do a peptide, for some reason, you left an oxygen in there. Okay, which made it wrong. So there's no, there's no. Oh, that was almost right. Unfortunately, um, in the context of you know year twelve, um, that's only a bond between carbon and nitrogen. There, there's no oxygen in the middle of that because we know that it's gone to produce water. Okay, so that's a very important error that some of you didn't need to make. Okay. All right, so this is our polyamide structure. So what are they going to ask you in the exam? They're going to ask you, where is the link in the chain? So they'll ask you to identify the link. Then they'll say, what sort of a link is it? Then they'll say, what is the repeating unit? And then they'll say, pick out from the chain the two monomers that made up this polymer. So you've got to be able to pick those things from these large structures. Remember, large structures are just made up of lots of little structures and the whole thing is not to get frightened when you see big molecules on a page in front of you. You go back to basics. What's the functional group? You've learnt the functional groups. You have know all the functional groups. What reactions do the functional groups undergo? You know the reactions. How do we test for the functional groups? You've learnt or should have learnt already all the tests for the functional groups. How do we make these things? Well, that was one of the things we learned in the organic. So we're just putting all that together in a big molecule. Same thing. So you're simply applying the concept in a real question. Okay, outside of the lab. So here is our structure here. So that's our amide link. And here is our amide link. So they're pretty easy to identify, I hope. You have to include the and the No, you don't. Oh, you're talking about here, don't you? Yeah. Oh, here and here? Yeah. Sorry? Sorry, Matt. So, yes, you do. All right. So, I don't normally put the water in, though. Okay, but I've got to include this whole thing. So, if I were to show that properly, I'll be doing like that in a test or an exam scenario. I've got to include the carbon and the hydrogen in there. Okay? So, I just can't cross them out. Everything counts. The next thing we need to do is to um, then not just identify the links in the chain. You could be asked to go back and redraw the monomers. And the best way to do that is to find the links first and then cut them. Okay? So once you cut links, that will help you to identify the monomers of the structure. And you're going to have to do that. You won't always be given the monomers, as you see the questions in the book. They give you a structure like this, and then they ask you to go backwards and work out what were the monomers that produced that polymer. That's a typical sort of scenario. Will? Yeah. Next is this. So what we do is, we've got to pick out the repeating unit. I've always said try and work from the left hand side. As far as what you can go. It's a little bit easier. If you pick it in the middle, you might end up You've, got, you've actually run out of um, atoms to the repeating unit. All right, so always just start from the left-hand side. We want an NH and CH2. So this is obviously one of my monomers there. And I'm going to keep on going until I get the repeat. And it looks like it's going to be here. And I've got N and CH, so there it is there. And so that is my repeating unit. And I've got to put an N there, okay, in that structure. So what we have here is one monomer, two monomers, and they're going to repeat themselves end to end for a molecular weight of about 10,000 or more. So, Question? The, um, the repeating unit only made of multiple monomers in it. For a condensation polymer, yes. Okay. For an addition polymer, there's normally only one repeating unit. This has got two monomers, okay? Not to say we could actually have three monomers or four monomers. Okay, that'd be a nice question. You could, I could easily make up a question on that. As anybody in SAIS could make up a question on that. Right. Same principle, just got four monomers. 
versus quinoids. Okay? Polyesters. All right, when we look at the polyesters, same thing. All right? When we did the section on esters, we talked about how do we make an ester, and we're going to be doing that next week for our experiment. Okay, so we're going to add carboxylic acid and an alcohol together. We're going to reflux those together for a long period of time. We're then going to extract the ester, and then we're going to distill the ester off. Same question we had in the exam, yeah? All right? And I told you that was one you had to learn. But anyway, so how do we make an ester? Carboxylic acid and alcohol. All right, so we just got this basically the next level up. We've got lots of carboxylic acids and lots of alcohols. We put them end to end. And so when we do, we'd end up with a compound that looks something like this. And this is obviously the beginning, okay, of our polyester. So again, that is going to spit out a water structure. But we're just complicating it by having lots and lots of these um, in the same formula. And I'll keep that over there lined up, more or less. And that would be the C dog on O. CH2, and then these take practice, all right? Didn't yeah, get it the first time that I did it. That's why you keep it over there, because it's two yeah. Sorry? Yeah, it's a carbon attached to the oxygen that remains, yeah? It's the same up here. The carbon attached to the oxygen is the one that remains. It's the OH that we lose in both. Um, yeah? No, no, it doesn't matter. I haven't colour coded it. No. Okay. No problem. So actually what happens is that these are the ones that go. Yeah. Okay. Alright. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes, this is the secondary A in the mean or A mid, yes. Okay? A mid, it's an A mid. Yeah. It's not an A mean, it's an A mid. So it's off being an A mean? Yeah. Okay. This is actually a primary A mean in this instance. When I read with a couple of gas, it turns into an A mid. We don't have to we don't have to categorise primary, secondary, tertiary amides. We do have to know primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary results for the amines. Uh, yes, good. Cool, sorry. That's only made when it's an amine and a acid. Only correct. Amine, carboxylic acid makes an amide. All right. And of course, I could have this happens to be a primary amine, but I could have a secondary amine there. Okay. Well, could I? Can I have a secondary amine? No. No, I can't. Alright? So I've got to have a primary amine in this instance to form this amide link. Because if I had an R group here, that was another carbon chain, okay? It's not going to be able to form an amide, or not a link that we want anyway, in this instance. So it happens all the, all the time from a primary amine. Alright, now, the next thing we want to do is to look at properties of polymers, okay? And as we've seen before, all of these things in front of me are examples of polymers, okay? So this one here is polyethylene water bottle that you've all seen and used before, probably paid too much for as well, okay? So this is a top of plastic, okay? And we could actually draw the structure of this one for because it's, it's called a PET bottle or PET bottle, polyethylene is this one. Um, this one here is also polyethylene, slightly different. You notice it's opaque, this one, all right? So, slightly different in terms of its um, makeup, but both of these are, would be addition polymers, not condensation polymers, okay? Because polyethylene comes from ethylene. Yep. No, not necessarily, okay? Um, there's nothing about cost at all, all right? It's about what you want at the end when you're making a plastic. What properties do you want? I'm getting there. Okay, now, so, the question is coming up, all right, as we've been asked already, is how do you make it biodegradable, all right? Did I show you the Polymers movie, uh, quick view a few weeks ago? I haven't? No. Credit to the U10s. All right, I'll show you guys as well. So, before we get there, Essentially, we can make a plastic for any purpose at all. This is an example of a plastic that they use for, for boards, right, on the decking type scenario, and these, this stuff will last forever. So if it lasts forever, it's not biodegradable, okay, so it tells me something about the properties of the polymer compounds in this structure. This is actually called a thermoset plastic. So if I were to actually try and heat this, if I put this in an oven, it's not gonna melt, this is actually just going to char, it's going to go black. Because there is something special about the bonding between these chains. These ones on the other hand, if I put that in an oven or if I put it in a Bunsen burner, it's just going to melt. I can even do it with hot water, alright? Because these chains are only bonded together with secondary bonds only. So back to that question about recycling, it's fairly obvious that this is not a recycled product because it's actually got links between the chains and they're not secondary bonds, they're primary bonds. Okay? They are not recyclable. Alright, so we can actually make any plastic we want for any purpose. It just depends on what we're starting with and of course what we want, want it to be used in. And you know you can make a car these days out of plastic. And I'm talking about the block, the motor out of plastic, the wheels out of plastic. Okay, the tyres out of rubber, okay, but rubber is based on a plastic or a polymer structure. So you can make a whole car, and they have done, all right, out of plastic. I should have done a bit of research and got the photo of it, all right, but they've done it, all right. Every single item. So wherever you use metal in structure, you can, you can actually use a plastic, all right, a very advanced plastic, but you can make it and use it for that purpose. Branching. Now, what branching means is this if we're talking about simply um, polymers, that are not thermoset polymers, if I look at a structure 
And if I have a structure, let me just get rid of some of this stuff. If I've got a structure that has got lots and lots of branching in it, it's probably going to tell me something about its melting point and about its durability and strength. So if I've got a structure of a polymer like this, for example, long, long chains, and we know from looking at these structures, what sort of bonds are going to happen between the chains in this instance? Whether it's a thermo, sorry, whether it's a polyester or a polyamide, can you work out what bonds are going to happen between the chains? H bonding. H bonding is going to be between the chains. Because we've got like oxygen sitting out here, and we've got H sitting up there next to an nitrogen, so we're going to get all of this lovely H bonding all the way along these chains. Not to mention the fact that sometimes well, these can be long carbon chains before we end up with a, another site where we can get H bonding. So we've got, actually got between the chains, we've got dispersion forces because the molecules are getting really large and there could be sections that are non-polar and we've got all the way along the chain, we've got H bonding and that's going to occur all, right, all through these polymer chains. So the longer the chain, Hopefully it makes sense that I would expect the stronger the polymer, the more durable the polymer is going to be. So if I do this, if I have got polymers that are short, okay, hopefully you can see that the ability for these shorter polymers, okay, to bond is much reduced. Much reduced. So any stress applied to this polymer Okay, it's going to obviously fracture through here. All right, multiple areas where this is going to break. So the example of that sort of polymer, and I haven't got one, but you know the classic shopping bags. You know, you put your shopping in it, lift it up, and goes. It breaks straight away. All right, because they're designed for that. They're not designed to be strong. They're just designed to take your shopping home. You chuck it in the bin with your rubbish, and it biodegrades. Okay, because. It's got small polymer chains that are broken down with ultra low, okay, and just in the, in the soil, okay, the microbes in the soil can actually consume these polymer molecules. So the shorter the carbon chain, the more readily the product is, it's going to be recycled. The carbon chain is important in relation to what we're talking about in these properties. They're all going to have secondary bonding, and we've seen it dispersion, okay, and H bonding. This is not in the course, but I'll just touch on it anyway. The other thing I'll put up there is branching. Now we did it when we did fats and oils. Remember we talked about an oil having a double bond and then the molecules, okay, branching off. That's why an oil was a liquid, because we couldn't pack the chains together to get nice dispersion all the way through it. Very similar to a polymer. Same concept, different application. So if I've got polymers that are like this, if they've got branches everywhere in their structure, there's no way, it's very difficult to get these to bond together in any ordered fashion. It's a bit like getting a whole lot of just bricks and throwing them in a pile, okay, all different shapes. You know how hard that is if you've actually don't have a brick wall. All the bricks are uniform in shape and size, lovely. But if you've got a whole series of different rocks and all sorts of things, they don't go together very well. Okay, not at all. No different to this. So this branching means that I might get some H bonding here, maybe I might get a little bit here, um, I might get some maybe through here, but on, on, on average, okay, overall, branching does not really um, add to the structure at all. It makes it very weak and very biodegradable, okay, which is what we want. So the sort of stuff that this is made out of, okay, would be short carbon chains, short polymers, and these would be branched. And if you look on to the sector lesson, there are six categories of recycling, and this has got a, can't read it, okay, there's normally a number in front of the recycle. Inside those little triangles, there's normally a number, okay, this one hasn't got one, I think it's when they stamp it onto the bottle, they've got a number in it. And depending on the number in the, in the bottle, Okay, on the bottle stamped on the container, it tells you the level of biodegradability is roughly what it's about. Okay, this one, um, it's got a recycle on it. Yeah, this one's got it down the bottom, and if I could read it, 
is what it says. It says, ah, oh, here it is. That's got a two in that box, okay? So whatever the two is, you can look it up, all right? And it will tell you the sort of plastic that it is, okay? And it's level of, biodegrad of biodegradability. This has got no stamp on it, okay? For obvious reasons, it's not recyclable, okay? This could have been made, by the way, um, I would assume that this is probably a recycled plastic. So it could have come from these things here, all right? And other plastics put together, and then how do we make these things like permanent? Heat them up, put them in a mould. It's not going to make them permanent, no. We've got to make them into a thermostat structure. Here's all right, the other category of polymers that we need to be aware of. And hopefully it just follows on logically. So if I have polymer chains, okay, side by side, we know the polymer chains have got within them secondary bonding. But if I do this, if I actually take the chains and if I put between the chains primary bonds, I now have one massive molecule. It probably shouldn't be called a molecule because it's like a continuous structure. It's almost like, okay, whoops, start that spider. It's almost like the idea of our graphite or diamond, not strictly speaking though, all right? But the cross-linking is what we're talking about now. Cross-linking uh, within a polymer turns it into a thermoset structure. So if I were to take these plastics here, okay, and if I were to react these with sulphur or any other compound that allows me to put links across the bonds, across the chains, I'm talking now not about secondary bonds but primary bonds, has to be done with heat, obviously, we've got to melt these. We'd add a compound that crosses the two chains, and we end up with a thermoset polymer. Okay? But obviously, as I've said already three times or so, that's it. That's where it stops. Okay? I cannot recycle this product at all because I've actually formed a permanent link, a permanent primary bond between the chains. Is that Nope, there's nothing in between, okay? You could get, in theory, again, you could have some partial cross-links, all right, but look, we basically, I don't know of any polymer that's, that's like that. They're either secondary bonding between the chains, or it's primary. There's nothing in between. So they're either categorised as a thermoplastic, okay, or a thermoset. Thermoset, locked in. Cannot redo, reuse a thermoset plastic. All right, they're a one island, one island, that's it. And they're a throwaway, unfortunately. All right, this process here, um, and if you again look in the sector, um, there is a video there, and it's on a process of vulcanisation. <coughs> vulcanisation, okay, and there was a bloke uh, called Goodyear. Okay, you might know that, yep, from a brand of tyre. Um, he was a... Um, I don't know what he did, actually. I don't know. Um, so he, um, I think it was something to do with cars anyway. He worked in the car manufacturing industry um, and by accident one day, I don't know what he was doing, but he was, he was experimenting with the rubbers that they used and that, that means natural rubber in the tyres of cars. Couldn't work out why they weren't going too good, you know get a few days out of them, they just shred to pieces. Um, and so, somehow, the, the story goes, we can look it up, but he had sulphur, I don't know why he'd have sulphur, he had sulphur on his stove and he, had, he was boiling the, like, the rubber from the rubber tree, and somehow the sulphur got into the, um, into the natural rubber, and he invented vulcanisation, the process of vulcanisation by accident, which is how a lot of things are discovered, by accident, okay? And so, vulcanising rubber essentially is putting cross links, in natural rubber, natural rubber fibres, to change a property. Because if you can imagine, okay, um, if you had a tyre on your car or your motorbike or wherever you're riding, okay, if you had a tyre that was actually based on a thermoplastic structure, it's not going to last for very long. 
okay, because all the rubber is going to just lift, it's going to go, all right, and it's not going to hang around for at all. So what we've actually done is, when I say we, I mean um, technology, scientists, the development of actually um, tyres has come a long way, um, and so they can structure, or they can make a tyre to, in theory, we can make a tyre last for the lifetime of a car. But when you think about how that would happen and what the implications would be, it would probably mean the tyre would almost be like solid rubber without a tube, or it wouldn't be tubeless, so that would be pretty hard to ride on. Um, and in terms of its durability and its ability to be recycled, that would be like a zero, all right? And the other thing is, in relation to that, we wouldn't have you know, an economy based around things that we can sell and recycle and sell and recycle. Now, we can't actually recycle rubber in, in, in that sense. So once you make a tyre and you've used the rubber and it's been vulcanised, I cannot just take a tyre and melt it and get the rubber again. But what do they do with tyres when they recycle them? There's two things that they do with them. What do they do with tyres when they recycle a tyre? What do they do? They make more tyres? No, they can't use the rubber in tyres, again. They use... No, they don't make pencil erasers, no. Yeah, they can use it. What they do is they, they shred the rubber up into spine, into a fine particle, and they put it into road base to basically pack the road base out. That's number one. Number two, you know all the playground stuff? All that rubber? Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's all comes from threaded tyres. All right? And so what they do is they put a polymer in there, a glue, to put all that stuff together, and they use it for that. If the casing of the tyre, so if the casing, of the tyre is suitable, okay, and there's a great video on uh, Sector about that, um, in terms of recycling tyres, it's a truck factory in America where they take tyres and they recycle them, we call those a retread tyre, and so what they do is, provided all the casing for the tyre is not being damaged in any way, because inside the casing these days it's normally steel, okay, steel belted is the term that we use, so provided the steel is okay, they actually lay another layer of rubber on the surface of the tyre using a special glue. It's a special polymer glue. What's the strength? How is the speed limited? Okay, so this layer goes on the tyre. You can't even hardly see where they're joined. All right, but they, but they are restricted in terms of their so speed. No, because what they do is well, they take off any existing tread. It's a bit like when you resole your shoes, they scrape all the sole off, and when they start again, they put a new sole on top. See, I've got retreads on my own wheel, see? Okay. Fresh kicks. No, but they, they had to scrape all the stuff off, all the leather off. In this case, they take all the rubber off, okay? And under very controlled conditions, the video's got a really good uh, details about how they do it. Um, they use a special glue very strong glue to glue the actual, the new tread, but to the outside of the tyre, okay? And it almost, almost looks like a brand new tyre when they finish. Almost, okay? But, all right, if you have a retread, they normally have a very, very important little warning on them, and they're normally speed limited. And the maximum is normally 110. Anybody know why? Yeah. Depending on the quality of the retread, what you find is that these things will lift off over time. They don't last forever, okay? A retread is cheap compared to a new tyre. It's about a third of the cost of a new tyre. And that's the attraction. But it's cheap, okay? Yeah, you won't get anywhere near the mileage of a retread as what you do as a new tyre. But it all, it all goes down to what you can afford. Jack? Is... Could be, yeah. There's nothing in the syllabus that says, in the, in the uh, outline, that says you have to know about retread tyres. Nothing, okay. But it does say you have to know about vulcanisation, okay. And this is just to actually fill out and give you the context of why 
why we talk about vulcanisation. Um, just on that point too, not that I want to rag on too much, but uh, for those of you that you know watch the Formula One stuff, and I talk about this um, every year when I talk about it, you know that all those compounds of tyres they've got, so they've got super soft, you know they've got the soft, the mediums, the hard, and then they've got all these colour coded tyres, all right. So as you can probably imagine, all right, um, it really depends on the manufacturer and how many of these cross links they're putting in their tyre. And if you were watching the, I think it was the, um, the GP, the Motor GP a few weeks ago, when they started off on their wet tyres, which are resume soft compounds, and after, or towards the end of the race, the rubber was just like flicking off the tyres everywhere. The tyres were go basically gone. Because they were using a soft compound tyre, and they are only designed for a few circuits of the track, because when they get hot, they get sticky. That's what they're after. They're after friction and traction, okay? No different, all right? So you can buy a very expensive tyre, which would be categorised as a sports tyre, and you put it on your car, and you might get 10 to 15,000 kilometres out of it. But a normal road tyre, you should be getting about 40. Sorry? That would be a fast 15,000 kilometres. Yeah. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so that's all we're going to do on polymers, yeah? That's it.